everyone. Here's Samalit Hogan with the Small Business Development Center. Happy to join you today here with attorney Sarah Willey from Buckley Richardson. She's going to be doing today's webinar, which, which we call Business Legal with Business Law Primer. Is for small businesses. Whether you have started a business or you're looking to start a business, you will find today's webinar very helpful in terms of knowing various legal aspects of business, including how to choose your business entity, what is the difference between contractors and employees, and how to deal with intellectual property. And Attorney Willie today has added a few other things about legal aspects in regards to starting a business during COVID-19. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So um, it's always great to um, be over at the SBDC, although I'll say this is very unusual to not be in the um, big room. Um, as uh, Samala knows, I tend to use all three blackboards and move around a whole bunch writing on those blackboards. So I'm going to try to contain my excitement for business law and stand in one place so that you can all see me. Um, Smalad will be um, pushing your comments through. Um, we'll see how it works. So if you, something comes up, um, certainly uh, send in your comment and we'll try to work it in at the right time. Sometimes- Yes, they can use the Q&A button at the bottom or right. use the chat to write in your question and I will help you, Sarah as the okay. questions come in. Whenever you wanna pause for questions, just let me know and I'll read them off to you. Okay, awesome. Um, so um, we, I'm gonna cover basically, well, three and a new four topic today, right? So the topics are the choice of entity, um, which means should I be doing business as a sole proprietor? Um, am I in a partnership? Do I wanna be in a partnership? Um, should I form a limited liability company? Is it time or is a corporation better? So we're going to go through how to make the choices between those um, four entities and the differences between them. We're going to go into intellectual property and cover the differences between a trade secret, a patent, a copyright, and a trademark. Um, we're going to wind up with employee or independent contractor. What's the difference and what's the risks of making the wrong choice? And then because you guys are all making the decision to start your business during the time of COVID-19, some things to keep in mind about doing that. Um, so normally when I'm on site at the SBDC, I do have the opportunity to talk with folks right at the beginning to find out if you already have a business up and running um, or you're looking to start it and the type so that I can kind of gauge my um, examples as well as um, kind of know what people are drawn for for allocating time. Um, so we only had a t I only got to talk to a few people beforehand. Um, so hopefully I'm going to allocate to spend enough time on the topic that interests you the most. So getting underway. A sole proprietor, right? Sole proprietorship, this is the quickest, easiest, fastest way to start your business. I call this me, myself, and I. I am the only owner of the business. Um, I make all management and financial decisions. Um, there is no separate legal entity from myself. I am simply doing business in my own name or a variation of um, name that I may choose. The biggest advantage of being a sole proprietor, right, is it's really quick, easy, low cost. You can wake up one morning and say, I'm going to start my business today. And by the end of the day, you can have your business going. So if you are going to be operating your sole proprietorship under any name other than your own personal legal name, you need to go file a doing business as certificate or a trade name certificate, sometimes called a fictitious name certificate, with your town or city clerk. Um, fees relatively nominal to go and do that. Um, when you go over and file your certificate, um, you'll get a copy back generally. Um, the second step um, is to obtain your federal tax identification number, also known as an employer identification number or an SS4. This um, will be your businesses. Um, essentially your business's social security number. 
Um, some sole proprietors choose to use their own social security number, but that means uh, providing your um, social security number to a variety of different customers and clients that pay you that may want to um, that information at the end of the year. Um, so a word about applying for a federal tax identification number. You can do it online yourself, but go directly to the IRS's website to do it. I've added the link um, down below. Um, if you go to there, they will ask you a bunch of questions about why you want an employer identification number, starting a new business or opening a bank account um, are the two examples that um, will cover most of you. So after you get your tax identification number, you should go and open your own a bank account in your business's name. Um, it's really important that even though as a sole proprietor, your business is not a separate uh, entity or person from you, to still not commingle the business funds. Um, so I recommend getting um, it, the business its own bank account. Um, most um, banks will also require that you bring your DBA certificate along. So what's the big disadvantage of having a sole proprietorship? Well, you have unlimited personal liability. So that means that there is no shield between the business, um, the business's liabilities and your own personal assets, right? So all contracts that you sign, um, whether it's buying a piece of equipment, whether it's a lease for office space, um, those contracts run to you personally because the DBA is just like having another name for yourself. Um, so, what are some ways to protect, right? Because for a lot of businesses, being a sole proprietorship is just fine, right? You wanna see, is there a need for your services? Is there, is it your client base going to develop enough to justify the cost of forming um, a limited liability company or a corporation? So you can look at getting business insurance to help protect against the risk. And if you own your own home, um, making sure that a homestead deed has been filed on that. Another disadvantage is limited access to capital, right? So investors, if you're going to be looking for investment funds, aren't going to just give you the money um, in your own name, right? So it's your personal funds, your getting ability to get a personal line of credit, maybe a line of credit on your house, um, but it's not going to, you're not going to have investors um, coming in as a sole proprietorship. Um, any questions before we move on? Does not appear there are any questions right now. So go ahead. Great. See, normally I would say how many people are in a whole, uh, have a sole proprietorship right now for a raise of hands, but I don't think that works. <laughs> well, let me see if I unmute everyone. Um, I should be able, we should be able to hear a few people um, or anyone go ahead in the chat. If you, if you have a sole proprietorship right now, would you type it in the chat? Say yes in the chat and then we can see it. That'd be great if you could do that. Okay. So it looks like, uh, yeah, there's one person there that does anyone else only one. Let's okay. see, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Okay, okay, so say we're good then. All so right. just one person so far. Interesting, okay. So moving on. Um, so when we're kind of thinking about the organizational structure, I kind of like to think of it as, as a hill with the sole proprietor being the uh, most simplistic, basic, uh, least expensive form and with the corporate form um, and the limited liability kind of at the, the top of hill. So when your business may start out as a sole proprietorship, it can gradually grow over time and it can move from one form of entity onward. Okay, the general partnership. So a general partnership forms, we have two or more people carrying on as co-owners to earn a profit in the business, right? And we all hope to earn a profit. 
Um, so the owners together share management and financial responsibilities. Um, they also share, they share the economic rewards. So the issue with a partnership is that they can be formed inadvertently, right? So if you are sitting around with a friend and you start writing out a business plan and you're each coming together um, to bring something to the table, maybe one of you has the creative idea um, for a new invention and the other of you has the marketing and the computer savvy and you say, let's, let's do this and you start running forward, you automatically have a general partnership. Um, a general partnership um, happens inadvertently, but also sometimes two people from specific um, skill sets. Um, so for example, they have, may have their own LLC decide to get together to form a joint venture to work on a larger project. The, the downside with a general partnership is like the sole proprietor, you have unlimited uh, personal liability, but you also have joint and several liability generally, which means that even if you didn't cause the harm personally, say it was your partner that did it, you can still be on the hook for it. Um, so what ways can we fix that? One is by having a partnership agreement that talks about the party's relative rights and responsibilities, um, the parties indemnifying each other for um, liabilities and expenses not caused by one or the other. Um, it's really important if you do a partnership to have a partnership agreeing, talking about um, how the business is going to be shared and how the financial rewards um, and economic liabilities are going to be split. So generally because of the unlimited personal liability and the joint and several liability, um, as well as a lack of clarity often regarding assets that are put in, you don't generally see too many general partnerships um, happening other than out of happenstance. Um, most people that are getting together um, to form a business with another individual um, are going right to the limited liability structure. Um, any questions about general partnerships? Okay, if you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in the chat or in the Q&A or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. This is your chance. Anyone have a question? I guess today if people are either very quiet, very shy, or they haven't had the coffee yet. <laughs> Looks like it. So um, we have Anita Eliason on the line. Anita, you're here with us. Hi, Anita. Hi, Sam. Good morning. Good morning. How Anita, are so you? Fine. Fine. Thank you so much. Good, good. So you and I, Anita, we work with a lot of business owners um, and we do a lot of uh, uh, the one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with them. What would you say some of the more like the, the questions that stand out when it comes to general partnerships or even, you know, business formation, which is what we're talking about? Well, what I would love Sarah to talk about at some point is um, the costs of doing some of these different uh, forms of ownership, because I think a lot of people end up being a sole proprietor because they're concerned that there could be huge expenses with forming themselves as an LLC or even a partnership. And so I think that with the starting businesses that I work with, you know, it needs to be mitigating the risk with the invest, kind of a risk benefit ratio. What does it cost to do it? And in and, and what way am I exposing myself? And the other question is, if someone decides to be a sole proprietor, can they offset their risk by upping their insurance, like their professional insurance? Is that a way to handle it as well? But I'd love us to talk at some point about the costs of these different um, ways of forming. Right, so, so flipping back to the sole proprietor, Anita, right? Um, so the, the great thing about it is it's so quick, easy, low cost, right? So if you're gonna be doing it in a name other than your own name, um, 
the filing of a DBA certificate um, is really um, inexpensive. It hovers right around $50 at um, present. That's the payment over to the city or the town clerk. Obviously, because you have that unlimited personal liability, um, you would want to try to reduce um, your personal exposure by um, looking at insurance that's appropriate for your business and also look at if you own your own home, um, filing a homestead deed or checking if you recently purchased it or refinanced it that a homestead deed was filed at, the, at that time. So going back down to a, a general partnership, because of the risks of unlimited personal liability, joint and several liability, and the um, lack of clarity um, that arises when uh, one partner puts in um, um, assets worth more than the other or provides more services. Um, I don't recommend a general partnership. Folks should be looking at moving on to an LLC. Obviously, anytime you're drafting up an agreement like a partnership agreement or a joint venture agreement, there is a cost associated with that agreement depending on the level of sophistication, right? How complex is the transaction that you're contemplating? So I'm gonna skip ahead then, Anita, over to the limited liability company. Um, so the limited liability company was originally kind of intended to take the best parts of a partnership with the best parts of a corporation and merge them together. So what we like about LLCs is your liability, uh, personal liability for the, um, for the um, liabilities of the company are limited. So what is this? It is a separate legal being. It is no longer you just using a pseudonym or um, a trade name. Um, this is a separate, viewed as a separate legal person from you, the owner or the co-founder, right? So you can have a single member, member limited liability company. The owners are called members. Um, you can have um, as many um, owners as you want, right? Um, there is a practical side of, of that, but um, so because this is a legal person, um, you have to file with the Secretary of State's office. So um, I provided the links um, and the screenshots coming up for um, how you would go about filing in the Commonwealth of Mass Massachusetts, right? So kind of going through the, the benefits um, of the LLC, um, it limits your personal liability for the business's debts and obligations. Um, you can um, have different rights among the owners. You can treat them differently um, as far as with respect to profits and losses. Um, so it's a very flexible um, uh, form of business. One of the key things to have though, um, particularly if you are having um, a co-owner um, or co-owners is an operating agreement. And so the operating agreement um, sets forth um, your um, agreements with your co-owners regarding how profits are shared, who owns what percentage, um, how you can sell or whether you can sell your ownership um, in the company to um, an outside third, third party or transfer it. Um, and so it's really an important document um, to um, form, to, to draft, and to have the discussion regarding the party's expectations, right? If your business partner decides that um, after a year, um, they're, they don't want to do this anymore, they, um, it's not what they intended, they want to take off a year or two and um, go um, hike Mount Everest or become um, a professional ballroom dancer, um, what happens to their investment? Do they get it back and, you know, take out um, desperately needed capital, right, during the first year that the business is formed? Um, is that 
something that you're going to allow them to do. Um, what happens if they die or become disabled? These are really important uh, conversations to have regarding the continuity of, of the business. Oh, I see Sarah? you popping up, Rita. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question for you, um, which I get a lot from my clients. You know, in terms of the cost of, of filing a limited liability company, that's one yep. of them because they're looking at other states to save some money on this. And can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of doing that? Um, like filing LLC in a different state just because it costs less money. And right. Th th the other question is, if you have an LLC in another state, do you need to file an LLC in Massachusetts as well? Right. So um, I believe that Massachusetts is the most um, expensive state um, to file an LLC in. There um, have been proposals to um, reduce the filing fee and the annual fee because it is a significant barrier um, to starting a business. Um, so the annual, um, the initial fee, as well as the annual fee are $520 a year. And certainly when you're starting up, that is a significant amount of money. If you form your LLC um, in another state um, that has a lower expense um, and you are doing business in Massachusetts, you will likely have to qualify to do business in Massachusetts, um, which, um, is makes it just as expensive or if not more expensive because now you are maintaining um, filing fees um, and taxes in more than one state. Um, so so there, is there a way to transfer your LLC from another state to this state or there's no such thing? No, so, um, so if you started your business in a different, um, a different state and um, are now resident and you're primarily running your business um, in Massachusetts. Um, there are a variety of techniques to um, transfer your business into Massachusetts so you're not um, having to maintain the entity in two states. Certainly there are cases where um, a business is formed in another state, most notably Delaware, um, and it also qualifies in Massachusetts or it may qualify to do business in 10 additional states, right? When you're having a brick and mortar shop because you've expanded to the whole Atlantic seaboard because you're so wildly successful. Right. And another quick question that I get a lot too, for those people who are thinking of starting a business here in Massachusetts, but eventually want to expand out to other states, you know, grow grow a franchise or, um, or maybe not a franchise even, just have another location. You start in Massachusetts and now you want to office, open another store in Connecticut. How would you go about that when you have an LLC in Massachusetts first? Um, so, so tremendous that you've gotten to that, that growth point. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, so you can certainly maintain your Massachusetts entity. Um, and then qualify to do business, say, for example, in Connecticut, if you're having a, for example, a brick and mortar store there. Um, depending on what the ultimate goals are, whether it is to franchise, um, whether it's to bring in outside capital to um, support additional growth, there may be any number of different operational structures um, that we could, could choose for that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, just looking through the slide. Four. Okay, so your steps to form a Massachusetts LLC. First thing, check the name and whether it's available. So here we go. Um, so checking name avail availability. This is a much different standard than if you are going to get a trademark. Name availability for purposes of forming an LLC or a corporation is not the same as obtaining a trademark. It's a much lower standard, um, particularly in Massachusetts. So if we're gonna check our name, we go to the Massachusetts Secretary of State's Division, uh, Corporations Division. And I've highlighted search by subject and we search the corporate name um, database. So, just highlighted in yellow, and it pulls up 
this field, search for business entity. I've, uh, I've typed in um, the name of my LLC, um, Butterfly Fields, because I am a habitual perennial um, gardener. Um, and uh, I've kept it on begins with, um, which is the easiest way to search. Moving on, so it comes back with no records found. Um, try a new um, search using different criteria. So I may be content, right, if I have a particularly unusual name to um, see that there has been no hits. Um, I can also, if I wanna see any other companies in Massachusetts that have butterfly, right, I'm really concerned about um, customer confusion. I'm thinking ahead maybe to um, trade marking. Um, I can type in the primary word, which is butterfly, and see what comes up. And so while butterfly fields was not a direct hit and there were no records found, when I put in um, butterfly, um, you can see on the right of your screen that it came up with 36 different um, companies, right? And so there's um, a whole variety of um, butterfly names. So there's none that um, would uh, get in the way of my filing my LLC named um, Butterfly Fields or Butterfly Field. Sarah, quick question here. Um, these are for the companies that are registered in Massachusetts, but what if you wanted to have a name of a company that might be registered in another state? Can you do that? Um, so if so you already know the company is registered in a different state with the same name so yes yeah, so if there's a if i want a, a business name um but there's another business registered under the same name in another state in another look you know not in massachusetts right so can so, i do that yeah so um in sure you can do it you should still put it in um and see if that entity that's out of state has qualified to do business in Massachusetts, right? Just because they're out of state doesn't mean that they haven't filed and taken the name in Massachusetts. But more pragmatically, um, I would want to be looking at um, the trademarkability if your business name is going to be also associated with your branding. Right. So, so you should look at um, uh, the, the trademarks, the U.S. Patent Trade Office, which you might talk about a little bit later on, yes. to make sure, check for any trademarks associated with the name of that business. So that way you stay away from it, basically, if there are. If there's no right. trademarks, then you could potentially go ahead and take the name and trademark your own logo and your name and all that, right? So <laughs> there's a question. Go ahead. I was going to say, right, one of the things to think about is you want people to go to your business and to go to your business because of the particular quality of product and services you provide. Um, so having an overlapping name um, is not necessarily a, a, a great thing, right? You want to be unique um, as a driver to your business. Right. So there's a question here in the chat. He says, um, I have formed my LLC in another state. Am I required to file a foreign entity or can I do a DBA here in Massachusetts? Um, so it depends on the, um, what you're doing in Massachusetts. So each, um, each state has its own rules regarding the nature and type of contacts that you have to have um, with the state in order to be required to qualify. So for most states, and I, I don't have Massachusetts off the top of my head right this second, for most states, it's if you're on the ground, um, have, have um, you don't have a brick and mortar, but you're sending um, people there for more than 30 days, employees there to perform services. Um, that's one of the triggers. Certainly having a, a brick and mortar office um, is one of the triggers. So um, it really depends on the, the nature of your contacts with the state. Right. I see, Anita, you raised your hand. Did you have a question or a comment? I do. Um, Sarah, is there a website people can check to see if somebody has a name anywhere in the country, like at once, or do you have to check state by state? Um, so certainly putting in um, the name that you want and 
kind of the logical variations into, um, you know, um, Google is a, is a great um, tool. Um, you can, um, we um, use an outside service provider that provides that service um, with their search engines. Um, if you were doing it on your own, you would have to go to each of the 50 states to see if anybody else um, has the, the same name. And um, I would be really surprised if your business somewhere does not find another business um, that has the same name. It would be extremely unusual. Another consideration too when you're picking a name is also your domain. Every business, I don't care what you sell, what you're doing, should have an online presence. And with an online presence, presence a URL, a web domain is required. So we, we often, like every session when we're talking with a new business owner, we say, search for that domain name first and at different times you can do that google domains GoDaddy. there's a variety of ways of trying different different types of domain names and to choose one that's unique to you that does have some keywords perhaps but um but it's really based on the name of your business so the keywords really come up later on with the search engine optimization but just to make sure that the name of your business is unique enough that won't be, get confused with another website and you uh, another consideration too if you have the funds is not just to buy the dot com but also perhaps the dot net and dot org uh, extensions at least for a short period of time so you kind of protect uh, that domain but that's just a quick little detail I wanted to share with people because even if you can't find your name here, um, it, whatever name you can use, say, is not filed with the LLC here in Massachusetts, you looked up the trademark, there's no trademark, and you're like, oh, yay, I can use that name. But then perhaps butterfly.com is already taken. So if that's the name of your business, um, you might want to think about a different domain name or a different name. Right. So also, you made a really uh, good point about um, having to have a website. Um, you also need to think through um, making sure that your mobile access to your website is mobile optimized because it's a real turnoff for potential customers um, to not have um, the same kind of access to your site um, if your phone's not, if phone um, viewing is not optimized. Right. Janie here asks, what might it cost to pay someone to do the research to make sure no one else has the trademark and name? So um, <clears throat> there's a variety of different entities um, that do outside um, searching. Um, generally, um, the searching probably, uh, I, I can't speak for all companies, but kind of a range would be 500 to 1500 dollars for um, the searches that you're contemplating generally. Okay. okay. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. All right. So we've decided that we are going to go with Butterfly LL, Butterfly Fields LLC. So how do we form it in Massachusetts? So um, if we're back at um, the corporation's division's um, main page, um, I've high, um, so where we were checking name availability with the lower screen on the right search by subject, we now move over to the left for filing methods and file online. So when I click on that, it takes me to a very exciting um, page that says if you're forming a new entity, click here. So I would click there. Um, and we're forming a domestic limited liability company. So what does domestic mean? So domestic means that domestic is the state that your LLC or your corporation is born in. Um, the opposite is foreign, right? So if we form a Massachusetts LLC and then we're going to qualify it to do business in Connecticut because we're required to under Connecticut's rules, the Massachusetts LLC would be viewed as foreign to Connecticut. So I'm going to click on domestic limited liability company certificate of organization. And it brings me to the actual page where I start to enter my information. 
for forming my LLC. So I get lots of questions all the time about number three, which is the general character of your business. Um, it, you don't have to provide a comprehensive treaty. Um, you can um, state it um, in much shorter basic terms. It doesn't have to be an agonizing pain point to think about everything, every service, every product that you may offer. Um, the next point that I get a lot of questions on is box number five, which is um, the name and address of the resident agent. So a resident agent is the person that you are designating to um, accept service of process if your um, company gets sued. So when a lawsuit is filed and the sheriffs are showing up to hand over that paperwork for the complaint, um, they're going to send it or uh, deliver it to the resident agent. If you live in Massachusetts, you um, can be your own resident agent. You don't need to pay another company to be your resident agent. If you live outside of Massachusetts, um, then you have to consider either having a service or if you have um, another co-founder who lives in Massachusetts or you're having um, a manager of the LLC, um, that person could all, that lives in Massachusetts, that person could also be the resident agent. Any, any questions before I move off this screen? And I want to remind everyone, uh, you can either unmute yourself. I've allowed everyone to be able to talk during this webinar and ask your question, or you can type it in the chat or use the Q&A button. And it doesn't look like there are any questions, so go ahead. Awesome. Um, okay, so this is just um, so everybody can see the... Um, the additional screens on the certificate of formation. Um, so basically it's asking where is the principal um, office going to be and who are the people in charge, right? So the manager is the person that runs the day-to-day -day operations. That can be you, the owner of the business. It can be you and one of your co-owners. Um, it can be, all of you can be managers. Um, you don't have to have a member, it could be member managed. Um, so basically just where's your, most of these screens, just where is the business going to be? Um, so Sarah, we do have a question here. Becca asks um, if she doesn't have to pay uh, in, uh, someone to be an agent. If you are forming a Massachusetts limited liability company and you live in Massachusetts, you can be your own resident agent, so you don't have to pay somebody to do it for you. Is that the, okay, did I hear the question you. correct? Yes, you did. Okay, all right, great. All right, so when you hit the click here, um, that is then when they ask you for your credit card. So after your LLC is formed, it's kind of the same steps in some respect as your sole proprietorship. You um, apply for your, your tax identification number. Um, there is, again, go to the same IRS um, website to apply online. It asks you um, uh, different questions. It asks you, are, is it only you that is the only owner of this LLC, or do you have multiple owners? Once you have your tax identification number, um, you can go open the LLC's bank account. So I often um, get questions from people who prior to forming their LLC, um, they get their EIN first. Um, my recommendation is not to do that, only because it asks um, when the business was formed and if for some reason you, your application um, to the Secretary of State is rejected, um, you would have an incongruity with the date on your um, EIN application. Um, so form the LLC first, then go get um, the tax identification number, then move on to opening the bank account. And the LLC should have its own bank account so that there's no commingling of your personal assets with the business assets. So um, Seth, real quick, you already mentioned that folks were to get that EIN number. 
the irs.gov do you have a slide for that or, or? i did not i i i i, I will next time I will upload it so okay but I do not no I worries. don't have a slide for it no worries but I do want to uh, remind folks because I did have a uh, client of mine who um, unfortunately just googled get EIN number and ended up contacting a company that charged her $900 to oh get an gosh. employer ID number where it's completely free and you can get it at irs.gov Right. And so I just want to, I always warn people about that. Right. So absolutely look for the, the .gov um, window. And this is something like you don't, you, you have this. I am confident that, that you guys can do this on your own. So don't pay um, a service to do it for you. So one of the big things about forming an LLC, right, is, um, is it's its own legal person. Um, and so you have to treat it that way, um, which is why it's important to open, um, have it open its own bank account. But in order also to keep it as its own legal person, your LLC is entering into contracts. It is not you anymore that's entering into it. So when you're forming a contract, whether, and I set this next phrase up very generically, um, whether it's for a service provider contract, um, you're selling equipment, um, you're entering into a lease, you're entering into a credit facility. The agreement is between whoever the first party is, whether that's your client, um, the person that's loaning you money, um, the landlord of the building where you're renting space, and the LLC. So, see, my name personally doesn't show up anywhere. So I'm putting my LLC's name in, and I'm saying it's a Massachusetts limited liability company. And then afterwards, we can call it for short form throughout the agreement, we can call it company, service provider, or lessee. It just depends on the, the type of agreement it is. Then it's really important that at the end of the agreement, again, that you're not just signing your own individual name, that it's set up to sign in your capacity as the manager of the LLC. So it should be set up Butterfly Fields LLC by me, the manager of the business. This way, I am keeping the liability shield. I'm keeping the, the wall up between Sarah as an individual and Butterfly Fields as its own person. Um, any questions? Yeah, there appears to be a, um, let's see here. There we have one open question. So for a home-based LLC, should I be paying utilities partially from a business account and the remainder from a personal account? So um, it, when you have a home business, um, so with a um, single member LLC, um, that is deemed to be what's called a disregarded entity. So from a tax standpoint, as opposed to a liability standpoint, from a tax standpoint, the business entity it's disregarded from you, the individual. So you're going to be filing Schedule C on the 10 on your 1040. Um, so that means that the um, percentage that's attributed of use that's attributed to your LLC um, will be accounted for there. So if you have a home office, your accountant uh, is probably going to ask you what's the square footage, um, and then to, to give you, they're going to figure out the percentage to your overall house or apartment. Um, and then they're going to take a percentage of your electric bill, the snow removal bill, the lawn care bill to make it the entrance nice for when your clients come in um, and so forth. Okay, and, and, and she clarified, this is a two member LLC married living together. Um, so it, it's, um, it's, your accountant's gonna ask for the same, for the same questions. Um, so it's gonna come down to the percentage of square footage that the business occupies. Great, we have another question and then I'll, I'll give Anita a chance. She has her hand up. So we have one more question here in the chat. What if I'm starting a business with my name in the title? Is that a bad idea? So like if I did uh, Sarah K. Willie LLC. Correct, is that Correct. a good or a bad idea? I mean, I think it's an indifferent idea. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's neutral. Um, 
a lot of people do it. Um, there certainly are a lot of businesses out there where you have a first initial last name, including some very large um, businesses. Um, do you, you just, still keep that veil, that corporate veil you talked about? You, you do, but it kind of heightens the um, having to be um, super diligent regarding the comma LLC, um, both at the beginning of agreements and always at the bottom of agreements and indicating that you're not signing in your individual capacity. Okay, great. Thanks. Anita, go ahead and ask your question. I have a client who signed a lease for a cafe about a month ago and is now going to be forming an LLC. Should she go back and sign the lease, re-sign it under the LLC? All right, so for, um, and this is, this is a really, thank you, Anita, this is a really common um, situation, right? Because we're talking about having a sole proprietorship and you can, it's quick, it's fast, you can be up and running in one day. And then as your business grows, you may find that you um, need or require um, to have the corporate entity around you. And what do you do with all, all those, those contracts, right? So as a sole proprietor, the contracts are in my own name and I'm, um, so that means that I'm personally liable on them. When I, when I switch over to my LLC form, I'm doing that to um, put up a liability shield. Um, so um, most businesses would want to consider approaching whoever they are in, cont in, in contract with, whether it's a landlord or um, an equipment provider um, or any other type of con business contract you have, and um, amending that agreement to um, be in the business's name. Certainly depending on the nature of the contract though, you may be asked to continue to um, be a personal guarantee. Okay, very good. All Any right. other questions from, from anyone? If you, if you have a question, you can raise your hand by clicking on the attendees button, typing in the chat or clicking on the Q&A, or you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm just gonna give it a quick second to look up and down here give everyone a chance to find that uh, chat box or the Q&A. Okay, looks like we're good. we do have one person on the phone uh, ending in 4389. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Let us know if you have any questions. Go ahead. No, I don't have one, no. Okay, good. All right, go ahead, Sarah. All right, so, so, um, so we're leaving the land of, of LLCs now. And we're moving on to the corporation. So the LLC is a relatively new form of um, legal entity. Um, it's about 45 or 50 years old now. Um, a corporation has existed for much, much longer than that, right? So when we think of a, a lot of the companies that are really real, well known, you know, we think that we're investing in, you know, Ford Motor Corp um, or any number of other um, companies that, corporations that come to mind. Um, so this is kind of a traditional structure that um, a lot of people feel very comfortable with, whereas the LLC um, is kind of a new um, creature for many people. Um, so corporation, unlike the LLC, right, where the owners are called members in a corporation, the owner um, or owners are called shareholders or, or stockholders. Like the LLC, the corporation is a separate legal person from its owners. And again, like the limited liability company, um, the corporation, um, oh, I have just picked up on a typo in my screen, is not <laughs> liable for its debts and obligations. Um, so it has that um, shield between, um, between you and the uh, business obligations, right? So structurally, the shareholders, which are the owners, they elect on a yearly basis a board of directors. The board of directors set global policy. They um, um, vote on fundamental changes. They also elect the officers, um, the president, treasurer, <coughs> secretary, or clerk, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, who manage the day-to-day -day operation. <laughs> One person, just like you can have a single member LLC, you can also have a single member corporation or you can have multiple um, uh, members and you can have multiple stockholders, right? So very similar in a lot of respects. So kind of what's, what's one of the big differences? Well, with a corporation, you have fairly rigid formalities. Um, required annual meeting of the shareholders, annual meeting of the board of directors. It's a, a much more structured um, entity than the LLC, which doesn't require um, annual, annual meetings. And people say to me all the time, yeah, well, having an annual meeting, I think that's, that's, so, that's such a little thing. It's not a little thing because you get so busy and caught up with running your business, right? And focusing on how do I grow my business and my present. It's those little pieces that don't happen. Um, and when they don't happen, that is um, viewed as not treating the corporation as its separate person. And um, it can end up being not deemed to be a separate person. That's kind of on the piercing the corporate veil, which means like the arrow goes through your liability shield. So Sarah, let's pause here for a minute because this, this is a very important topic and what you brought up was, was super important. I want to make sure everybody understands this. Basically what you're saying is that if you establish a corporation and you're not doing your annual uh, meetings and the filings that are required as part of the corporation, you know, um, especially the annual meetings in particular, say you, you are doing your annual filings, you're paying your annual fee, that's fine, great. Yep. You're paying the state for that, so it's still in good standing, so to speak, but you're not doing the annual meeting minutes and other things. So if, if you were to get sued, for example, somebody could potentially say, well, this person wasn't really treating this corporation as a corporation, and therefore you lose your liability protection. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. It's the, it's the little, it's the, always the little things often that, that, that get you. And certainly, right, when we were talking about the LLC, it has to file its annual report. And that's essentially the same information that you put in every year. But then it doesn't have to have an annual meeting of its owners. And it doesn't have to have an annual meeting of the people that are running the business. It, you, you are required to do that in, in the corporation. And sometimes that's that little extra burden that takes your company, company down. Because I've seen companies that have just never bothered to file, you know, have annual meetings and board of directors. And there's no minutes and no votes and no consents. So... Right. And here's a question from the chat. Is there a difference between an S Corp and being incorporated? Excellent. That is the next slide. So that's a great transition, right? So um, when we talk about corporations, um, we actually almost never hear just corporation by itself. We hear of, um, it's referred to as a C Corp or um, an S Corp, right? And so the C or S um, simply denotes the tax status that it's chosen. It doesn't affect the uh, legal entity itself. The designator solely relates to its um, tax status. So when you form your corporation um, at the Massachusetts Secretary of State, so you put the data in and I'll show you the screens coming up next to that. Your, um, and then you go to get your tax identification number, your corporation is automatically going to have um, C Corp status, right? So this is two levels of taxation, right? So the corporation itself pays its federal income tax. It then distributes the profits to its shareholders, um, dividends. The shareholders then pay personal income tax on those dividends. So there are two levels of taxation. The corporation, um, if it is deemed to be a small um, corporation, um, can make a, what's called an S election. Um, and this is just filing um, an IRS form. And it reduces the two levels of taxation um, so that the income and loss flows directly through to the shareholders on the individual tax return. Re return. So the corporation itself is not paying um, the federal tax at the federal level. 
So what makes it small? Well, there's restrictions on who can be a shareholder and how many that shareholders you can have. First, it's limited to 100 shareholders. I know you're like, oh my gosh, 100, that's still like so many <laughs> owners, right? Uh, but 100 or less, it's small. Um, you have to be a US citizen, lawful permanent resident, and you can only have one class of stock. Um, so that means you have common stock, but you can't have a preferred round. So that impact would come in if you're looking at having um, certain types of investors coming in. Did I get at the question? Yes, yeah, so uh, basically when you, incorporate, when you incorporate your business, you are creating a corporation and these are the various types of corporation. So an S corp is a type of corporation. Right. So a corporation is a corporation. It just, um, whether it's a C or an S, um, that is just a designation of its tax status. And it has, and the election that it's made with the IRS has nothing to do with its legal being. Okay, great. That does answer the question. And another question that I get sometimes too is from folks who are building a company and they want to they're hoping to build this business to the point where they can pass it on to their children and maybe have them join and take ownership of this, of, of the business. You know, I've heard varying different opinions on this. So people say do not form it as an LLC if you're going to pass it on to heirs or you can start as an LLC, then incorporate and then pass it on to heirs. Like what's, what's your opinion on this? What, what's, what's the truth? <laughs> right. So, so, so the truth is there's no one right answer. Um, you're, what you're looking at is you're um, looking at um, what the business does. Um, you're looking at the um, individual, um, the, the individual uh, tax issues for the owners um, and how that would flow through and, and play out. But certainly you can transition um, both entities um, to family members and, and heirs. Um, I would not form one entity over the other simply for that issue because a lot can change down the road and over, over time. I would look at whether the structure makes sense um, from um, what the business is, um, what your personal tax issues are, um, and what the, the goals are for um, fundraising also. So, so this, this kind of borders or is part of the topic of business succession planning, right? Yep. And I'm finding a lot of our entrepreneurs, God bless them, they're mature age and they're sort of getting closer to like the retire, like technically the retirement age or whatever. So they're really thinking about, I'm going to start this business. I'm going to provide for myself for retirement. I'm going to have fun with this. But then you should really be thinking about, you know, if you want the business to go on um, after you or for a long time, think about business succession and who might take over that business and how your business is currently structured to be able to have a successor. If you have an LLC, is that easier to do with an LLC or with an S with a corporation? Would you, who would you yes. recommend people go to for help with that? Um, so um, I would recommend that they, in conjunction with their lawyer, um, um, get together with their accountant and take a look at their full um, financial picture for um, what works is going to work best for them. I mean, very pragmatically, right, in both um, an LLC and a corporation, you have your ownership interest, whether it's expressed as um, shares of stock in the corporation or it's expressed as a membership interest or units in the LLC and you're simply transferring that ownership um, interest. It, it transfers much the same way absent any particular restriction you and your uh, co-owners have put into place, right? And so that's a discussion to have with your co-owners whether in the LLC that discussion is uh, memorialized in the operating agreement or in a corporation, um, whether it's memorialized in a shareholders agreement, um, how and under what circumstances you can 
pass um, on your ownership interest to your heirs. Great, thank you. Sure thing. Uh, okay, so steps to form a Massachusetts corporation. A lot like forming the LLC, right? So check name availability, um, follows the same process as with an LLC. Uh, <clears throat> then we're gonna file articles of organization with the Mass Secretary of State's um, $275. After you do that, you go apply for your EIN, open your bank account, and then the kind of the new step, file your S election if you desire that. And then thereafter you have that annual report. So kind of looking back at the steps, um, <clears throat> um, you go back to the file online methods, except that when and you click on, I'm forming a new entity, except when I um, go to the filing system page, I select <clears throat> Domestic Profit Corporation organized Articles of Organization instead of the Domestic Limited Liability um, Certificate of Organization. So the screens do look a little different. We have a I, question here from Jeff. Sure he says when he started his business, when he has started his business, what is the, the official start date he should use when answering the question? On any forms. So, what is the official date? Is it the date that he gets that certificate from the Secretary of State that his business has been filed? Is it, that the official start date? That's the official start date. Okay, great. I thought so, but I wanted to share the question with you for the benefit of our viewers. Excellent. Um, so, looks a lot, but a little bit different like the LLC, right? Asking what the name is, asking what your general purpose is. Um, question that tends to um, hang up people is class of class of stock. Um, so it gives you a whole bunch of, of choices. Um, you can do, right, so you're creating common stock. That is the basic form of ownership of a corporation. Um, so the, uh, for most people, the choices that they're making is common with par or common no par. Um, historically, most um, corporations have par, and that par is 0 0.0001 or some really, really small number, which is the minimum value of a share. And this is kind of a leftover historic relic in many respects. Um, for um, for um, most companies, um, most folks are going to be answering um, none. That may not be the case for your, your own business and your unique situation, um, but it asks about uh, classes of stock. It asks about restrictions. Um, there's kind of a split mentality on whether restrictions on transferring ownership should be put in the articles of organization or in a separate uh, shareholders agreement that uh, goes to that earlier question regarding the ability to pass on um, your ownership interest to your, your heirs. Um, effective date, um, unless you're kind of filing around the holiday, most people want the effective date to be when filed. Um, really just kind of the basic information going to like article eight, right? It's gonna ask, where's the business located? It's gonna ask the same question about the registered agent. Um, it's going to ask who your president, treasurer, and secretary are and who your directors are. Again, this can be one person can hold um, all the places if you're going to be the only um, owner of the corporation. I hear people chiming in. Is that a question coming um, in? No, I don't think so. Um, but, but this is a good time to stop real quick. If, does anybody have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself or ask in the chat. You know, here's one question for you, Sarah. I see all this stuff in here, and um, this is something you mentioned before we could do ourselves, but would you really recommend that we do it ourselves or reach out to a, an attorney or mm -hmm. accountant to help us? So certainly, um, certainly filing an LLC has a um, lot, uh, many, many fewer questions, particularly regarding um, the nature and the type of authorized stock, right? So. Again, this is one of the LLC being a, a simpler, uh, less 
you know, uh, less rigid formalities. Um, many people are going to have difficulties unless um, with forming the corporation on their own. So, and, and then frankly, with the availability of an LLC to be taxed um, uh, in the same manner as a as a corporation, the choice that we see most often is for the LLC. But I thought I would include it here. Great. And I see Jen, uh, do you have a question for Sarah? Jen J? Okay, I guess she doesn't have a question, but, uh, but one thing that I did wanna, um, uh, mentioned Sarah, which I think is important too, that, you know, we, we are, we are going through all of this because it's important for everybody to, to know this information, but it, you're not required to have an LLC or a corporation in order to do business. You already talked about the sole proprietorship right. and, but there are advantages to having the LLC or the corporation primarily is that liability protection that you get. From, from those two different right. entities. Right, so the, 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 the two biggest reasons with number one being liability protection and the second um, reason being um, access to um, additional capital and um, funding opportunities. Right, so it, I have a, when, you, when you are a startup, okay, so Jen, go ahead and ask your question. I have a question. Um, if you're a startup, um, and uh, you mentioned, I just, I got on late, so I didn't hear a lot of it, but I'm a startup, brand new, and I've been told to file an L LLC right away. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have any income coming in. Um, so my question is, um, if you have an umbrella policy on your home, <clears throat> would that protect you in some ways from, you know, not having an LLC initially? Right, so uh, when we talked about the form of a sole proprietorship, um, we talked about ways to re reduce um, the, the risk, and one is making sure that your insurance policy, that you have an insurance policy that can mm -hmm. um, cover um, your business and what you're doing. So my recommendation would be that you sit down with your um, insurance representative and mm -hmm. talk about what your business is going to be doing, um, mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that the insurance is adequate um, until you form your LLC. When you say adequate, can you, can you um, clarify what you mean by that? Is it, so for example, I have a, I have a homeowner's insurance policy and then we have a, um, a, an umbrella policy over that to cover everything. Would it be just for that umbrella policy? Would it just be for the home and not my business? And therefore I have to go and really talk to them about my business? I would absolutely go and talk to um, your um, insurer uh, to make sure that business risk is, is covered. Certainly with your homeowners in policy, you're not going to see um, protection for um, cybersecurity through your business. If you um, have a cybersecurity uh, breach, um, you know, if you are providing professional services um, that is subject to uh, professional liability. I, I don't see that being covered under your homeowner's policy as well. Okay. Okay, so, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thanks. Right. Go ahead, Sarah. Mm -hmm. All right. So just, again, this is just basic information. And again, you hit the submit and they charge your credit card. So um, that's kind of tying up um, the form and choice of entity. For um, most uh, businesses, they're going to um, either start as a sole proprietorship and end up as an LLC or a corporation, or they're going to start right as an LLC out, out of the box, um, kind of just after having some initial discussions um, with advisors and um, co-founders, if there's, there's any co-founders. Um, if there's any questions as we leave this segment, otherwise we're going on to intellectual property. We're looking good here. Excellent. Okay, so what the heck is intellectual property, right? So the items on the, the, the left describe broadly everything that 
could be intellectual property, right? And most generally, intellectual property is anything that your mind creates, whether it's a recipe, a work of art, a song, uh, the invention of a useful thing, a device. Um, the words on the left are the legal protections that are available depending on what type of thing your mind creates. So whatever your mind comes up with and whatever you make or build or design or write, it will fit into one of the legal protections on the left. And so that's a trade secret, a copyright, a trademark, and a patent. Um, so trade secret. <clears throat> Everybody has trade secrets um, in their business. So a trade secret is information that gives your business its competitive edge and makes your business unique. Um, what is a trade secret in your business may not be a trade secret in somebody else's business. It is very um, specific to your operation. Um, so it can be a recipe or a formula, designs or drawings, pricing structures, um, pattern compilations. Um, it's really very um, unique to your business. So I get a question all the time. Uh, give me some guidance for when I know something is a trade secret. And so the first kind of easiest test when you're out, about, out and about and having conversations with potential business partners or potential distributors of your product is if you would stand in front of your business, your biggest competitor, and you would happily tell them this piece of information about your business, it's probably not a trade secret. If you have that sixth feeling in your stomach, you're like, oh, should, should, I, should I really be handing over this information? Or, oh my gosh, if, if I tell them this, then in something cataclysmic what happened to your business, you're probably in trade secret land and you should um, be thinking about um, protecting that information. I did put up here kind of the, the, the legal parameters that define what a trade secret um, is, um, but on a very practical basis, uh, I don't consider them that, that helpful. I really think that, you know, thinking about would I tell this um, and shout it out to the world um, and shout it out to my biggest competitor as being a really good me measure um, for um, people when they're starting their businesses. Um, I saw somebody's pop up on the screen. Is there a question? Well, let's see. Um, looking over here. Um, nope, no one has their hand up. I don't okay, see my a question. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Somebody else's square popped up, so I wasn't sure if that that was that. Oh, okay, no problem. The, but but I do I do want to add to this, uh, Sarah. Um, you know, we are here in Western Mass. We have quite a bit of startup programs, so to speak. So we we have our business basics, which we we run. I'm going to do one this this Friday, by the way, for the folks who are listening. You can sign up on our on our website, mspdc.org, is called the uh, basic steps of starting a business. Um, and, you know, even though uh, you sign a confidentiality form with us, when you are in groups with other people, when you're sharing about your business, you should always be conscientious about not sharing too much or any trade secrets. Telling like what kind of industry it is, the more or less what the business product is, that's not a big deal. Um, and how you plan to market it and all that stuff, that's fine. But talking about how is it made, any any secret sauce that you put into that product, that's something that you definitely do not want to talk in public, whether it's with us or at another uh, program where they're giving you advice to starting a business. And if you do talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you wanna make sure you have the confidentiality agreement in place. And when you talk with an MSPDC advisor, you have that when you sign that request for counseling form with us, so we keep everything confidential. But I'm just warning you, that's not the same with other uh, programs that might be out there. So you do wanna ask for that uh, in advance, make sure that there is a confidentiality form. And there's many great programs out here here in the region, you have uh, E4All, Sparking Holyoke, there's Valley Venture Mentors, 
So, and there's other uh, technical assistance providers out there as well that we've done many workshops with, um, SCORE, Center for Women Enterprise, all of those. Those tend to have those already in place, but you always should ask. Right. Like for, so, for, for example, um, and, and Smile, you make excellent, excellent points, right? If I, if I um, have a new, um, if I, I've created um, a particular type of uh, fingernail polish, right? And, um, you know, my marketing line is it doesn't, it won't chip off and it lasts, you know, X times longer than everybody else's. And that's because I um, have a specific order in which I put the underlying agreements in um, that that it's not necessarily it's not confidential right that I'm marketing my fingernail polish but what would be a trade secret likely is the the order of um, that I put the ingredients in that gives it its unique property um, or even the um, where I'm sourcing my um, ingredients um, from uh, my sources of supply. Um, certainly when you're talking about food and spicing, you know, where you buy spicing from um, which part of the world based on soil conditions, um, it may have a, a different flavor. Um, so that may be your treat, your, your, your core secret, right? So it's that special information that gives you the competitive advantage, right? So um, you talked about an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement, a confidentiality agreement. Um, they both mean the same thing. So in order to protect your, your trade secrets, you absolutely have to have a, a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement. Um, so I look at a lot of them on a weekly basis. And so um, here's a couple things to think about um, as you're looking at um, evaluating confidentiality agreements. Um, the, the first is, and I'll kind of go out of order from the, the points, the, the, the first is the duration of the trade secret. So um, many NDAs that I see say that the receiving party, so that's the person you're giving your secret to, agrees only to keep your secret for two years or five years um, or, or some specific period of time. If it is a trade secret, it is a trade secret indefinitely. There are lots of well-known international companies that have had trade secrets for a hundred years. Um, and if they had allowed their NDAs to say, the trade secret only lasts for five years or 10 years, they would not have their unique competitive um, advantage. So, don't be fooled into accepting an artificial um, timeline. It's not in accordance with the law of trade secrets. Um, sometimes you're maybe working with a, you know, someone that's a, a bigger fish than you, um, but your trade secret is to remain trade secret as long as it is, as you say so, and it has um, value to your, to your business. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the second issue I see is that um, many NDAs say that the disclosing party, so that you who you're giving, your, you're disclosing your secret, um, has to mark um, all of the information and the materials that are um, confidential or want to be kept confidential. Um, they have to mark it, right? put confidential, put trade secret on it, or if they've made a verbal disclosure, either through a, a touring um, a plant or maybe out at uh, lunch. Um, they have to follow up within 30 days in writing and say, do you remember when I came out to your factory, um, you know, two weeks ago um, to decide if we were going to make my widget there? Um, when I told you um, our requirements, that was uh, confidential information and you need to keep it as such. That's a really high standard, both marking and following up in writing. Those are really high um, standards for a lot of companies to meet, right? Particularly when you're starting your business and your focus is on growing the business and getting financing and being out there. It's those little pieces again that um, make it really easy to, to slip up. 
So um, I always try to avoid having a, a marking or follow-up in writing requirement. Any questions? Great. All right, so kind of like the, the takeaways, one, it's a, it's a secret, so you have to keep it secret, right? It's limiting access, and by having an NDA, you are showing that you're intending to, to limit um, access to it and making sure that if you're giving over your confidential information, that you do have an appropriate NDA in place. Questions before I move on? So Sarah, quick question. Um, I had a client a couple of years ago um, who had a product that he was um, creating. He had a prototype and he wanted to take it to um, a, a, a someone like Walmart, for example, who has a program where they would accept quote unquote accept um, applications for inventions and they would do the manufacturing and everything for that. You know, um, we had a really great conversation in, in one of the conversations that suggests that he bring an attorney with him to those conversations uh, because um, it was unclear whether or not they would be willing to sign an NDA even before having the conversation. But, but you know, you should always ask for an NDA be before having those conversations with anyone who wants to look at your product closely. Right, and, and um, so an NDA protects the information that you don't want somebody else to use or disclose, um, and information that you often want to keep secret, um, and that's not eligible for patent protection. Um, Smalad, you brought up um, filing for, uh, you brought up that it was an invention, right? And so when we're talking about inventions, um, we are starting to kind of move over into um, the land of patents. Right. And, right. Um, and so the, um, a patent and a trade secret. Oh, I lost your sound for a minute there. Oh, can you hear me now? Let's see. Hmm. Can anyone, okay, go ahead. I can hear you now. You can hear me now? That was really weird. Um, so um, a patent and a trade secret are on opposite sides of the continuum. A, in order to protect a trade secret, you have to keep it secret. Um, a patent is on the opposite side. You tell the entire world exactly how to make or do your invention in exchange for the government um, protecting that um, invention for a period of time. So they're, they're on opposites. And, and just because you have one doesn't mean that you don't have the, the other. Anytime you're having business discussions with potential partners, uh, service providers, manufacturing, um, um, providers, um, you should have a non-disclosure agreement, even if you have a patent um, telling um, the whole world how to make it exactly. Um, so um, just in the context of time, so if you think you have a patent um, or your, your invention is eligible for patent protection, I would encourage you to um, seek legal counsel sooner rather than later. Um, and this is because in, um, I believe it was 2012, might be wrong on the year, but we moved away from a first to invent rule to a first to file rule. Um, and so that changes the ability for you as the inventor to have priority. So essentially, someone that didn't necessarily invent your invention, um, but beat you to file on it, um, could have a senior status um, and, and take away your patent rights. Um, so if you think that your device, your invention is patentable, before you um, take it out to a show to find out if there's um, distribution interest or people want to buy it wholesale and put it in their in their shops um, before you do that have a consultation um, because certainly there are um, companies that go to large shows for whatever it is that you may have made 
and they um, send teams to um, look at your uh, invention and then go back and file before you and then knock it off and have it in the marketplace. So um, this is one where it's really good to be um, prudent um, and cautious. Trying to just look at kind of key, key points. Oh, another key point is um, if you have uh, an invention that you think is patentable, you only have 12 months in order to file for a patent um, after you have put your invention out into the public. So this means you write an article or do an academic or other publication, you bring it to a show or a convention to, a, to a find market interest in it. From that time period, your 12 month window starts to tick and at which point you can't ever apply for a patent on it. So protecting um, inventions when they're in their early forms, right? Have an NDA in place. If you haven't gotten a patent, you haven't applied for it yet. Um, certainly if you have employees um, or uh, consultants that are assisting you, you have them have an NDA as well as um, um, an agreement that says who owns uh, the intellectual property related to the work that they um, do on it, uh, on your invention, um, if they make any improvements upon it. Um, any questions? And, and, and Sarah, certainly there are ways for, um, for example, if you're running a restaurant um, and you have employees and you don't want them to steal your recipes, there are ways to um, pre-prepare -pre some of the uh, ingredients, say the secret sauce, and just have a, a bucket that just says secret sauce on it, but it's already pre-prepared so you don't give out your recipe to those employees. Those are some of the uh, ways to kind of protect some of your intellectual property that I've seen, especially in the restaurant industry. Certainly, if you are in the, in the service industry and you're providing a service, you are writing stuff, you know, copywriting stuff or, or, or designing uh, something for someone else, there are other ways to protect those as well. And many times your, your clients, if you're doing it for a client, they will ask for ownership of that asset, of that design that you created as part of it. But there's certainly uh, certain companies um, that are designers that retain ownership of the asset um, unless you're willing to pay for it as well. So there's many different ways of, of dealing with this intellectual property aspect. And um, so yes, you definitely, as, as you said, seek legal advice when you are first starting a company, figuring out your contracts, you know, your agreements with your clients. That's why that's so important because in that agreement with the client, it's not just a simple like, Here, here's an invoice or here an estimate. I'm just gonna do this for you and that's it. That's fine, but you may be leaving money at the table or maybe not protecting your assets as well as you could. Right, um, right. And um, certainly um, it's very, um, it's expected or very common that um, with um, certain types of trade secrets, whether it is um, a recipe for the secret sauce that, um, the group of people actually putting the ingredients together is a limited group. Um, but even, um, the, even as far as um, knowing the sources of supply and the measurements that go in, that can be further fragmented. So it's really unique to um, each person's business um, for what fits to limit um, exposure, right? And balancing between the confidential information trade secret and going to get a patent on uh, if my invention is patented, patentable um, before I put it out into the public domain. All right. So what is a copyright? And um, Smalls, you just actually, you mentioned the word copyright in your, your last uh, mark. So a copyright is the legal protection for original works of authorship. Um, so thinking kind of, very generally, right? Books. Whenever we open up a book, um, a paper book, um, and actually online books too, 
um, the inside cover always has the, the copyright um, notification, right? That, so it has that C that's uh, in the circle, the year and who owns it. Um, and that is generally um, the, the, the author or the creator. Um, but beyond books, it's um, manuscripts, it's plays, it's songs, it's compositions. Um, so the world of copyright is, is broad. Um, copyright exists from the moment um, that it's created, but you do have to take additional steps to um, affirmatively protect it. Um, so one of the things um, I recommend is that with your work of authorship, whether it's your web page um, or um, your recipes or your manuscripts, right, that you put the C in a circle the year you've made it and the author or the owner of it. Um, and so particularly with websites and blogs, right, they're not stagnant creatures. We update them all the time. So you can put the initial year and then hyphen and then just change the year as you um, make updates. So um, kind of like in the toggling back and forth between self-help and not self-help, right? I'm a sole proprietor. I can file my DBA myself. I can go get my tax identification myself. Um, most folks are comfortable getting their LLC. Again, their tax identification number. Corporation might want to uh, seek help for that. Um, trade secret, you know, an NDA, I gave you the key things to look at. Um, patent, you absolutely need outside help to file for that. Um, a lot of um, clients I talk to are actually pretty successful in filing for their own copyrights. Um, the U.S. Copyright Office um, has a really great interactive um, website that essentially gives you boxes to check. I have a song, I have a manuscript, I have architectural drawings, I have photographs, and you click on what it is um, and it kind of just leads you through the, the steps. With your um, employees, um, even though the employer owns the copyright, um, I um, always recommend, right, that you have agreements regarding ownership of intellectual property with um, your employees just to make sure that everybody is on the sage, same page and um, there's no confusion regarding um, who owns what or what the expectations for documentation are. Um, certainly with any outside providers who are assisting you with creating copyright, copyrightable material or patentable material, um, you absolutely wanna have agreements with them um, as well. Any questions coming up? I, it doesn't look like it not at this point. Great. Oh wait, it looks like there's one person. Jen, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. How, how, I mean, you mentioned, um, um, right required to bring an infringement case. Um, how loose is that? Because like you say, websites are so, um, open. Um, and even that, you know, that, C year author is on a lot of different websites, but people can cut and paste at any time. So how, I mean, how, how strict is that com compared to say like a book? I know a book or anything else might be even more. So what, what are the levels of um, leniency or not on those situations? Right. So you have, I think, is it the next one? You have this concept of, of fair use, right? Um, so when you're talking about um, sampling or um, parody, um, you know, um, you know, Saturday Night Live, one of my favorite shows, they, they parody um, a, a lot of um, well-known um, products um, and situations. Um, so there is this concept of, of fair use and it looks at the reason for the use. Is it um, commercial? Is it educational? Um, what is the impact on the, the, the owner? Um, kind of very pragmatically, right? If you're um, finding um, your snippets from your blogs or portions of your blogs being um, popping up elsewhere, um, 
you probably want to do an evaluation first of how it's being used because um, is that person um, sharing your copyrighted material because they're, they're a huge fan um, or they're a practitioner that um, um, follows you um, and they have their own group and they're passing on the information. Is there a beneficial synergy to, um, to the relationship with the person that's, that's taking, um, using your information? So I kind of recommend looking at it um, in a very unemotional sense um, and assessing harm versus benefit and the reason why the person is doing it, right? Are they simply trying to ride on your laurels? Um, and, you know, that would be kind of tilting towards unfair or um, is there um, a beneficial relationship that can come from pinging them and saying, hey, um, I, I noticed that you're taking large portions of my material. Um, I do want to let you remind you that it's, you know, copyrighted would love to um, figure out a relationship for you to continue to um, use it, but in a way that um, preserves my ownership, right? So before we wage war, seeing if we can um, have um, a peaceful relationship that is maybe a win-win for both people and grows both people businesses and grows your p business even more from having um, more followers. So there's a, uh, um... Uh, I want to jump in real quick in here. There's a couple of things. There's a question in the chat, and I will go to it in just a moment. But I did want to, um, this is very common, say, on YouTube, for example. There's no copyright music or videos and things like that that you can certainly download and use in your own materials. And sometimes in the description, it does say that you can use it for your projects, but you have to copy and paste a certain credit. Uh, crediting the author and perhaps sharing their website and other tags that they want you to use when you're using their materials. This is something that can be used in other forms. If you have a, uh, uh, a video in other in your website, you could say that other folks are welcome to use that material, but they must give you credit. Same thing with photos. The question in the chat is about, does, some, does a photographer, for example, need to copyright every single photo? What if, what if they have thousands of photos on their website? I would, I, I, I'll let you answer that, Sarah, in just a minute, but I would will, I will say that using technology, there are ways to protect your images online in various ways. You can do a watermark, uh, but it might be, you might say, well, I don't want to use a watermark because it makes it look ugly. And if I want people to buy it or whatever, I want them to be able to see it. There's ways to deactivate the right click, but that doesn't really protect it from people who just want to do a screenshot. Um, there are, but there, there are um, different platforms out there that do allow you to upload your materials and prevent people from copying them or can alert you of when someone else is using that image online without your permission. But, but Sarah, how, how would you say, I mean, there's so many different ways to, to kind of protect your information, but it, it really comes back to how do you monitor it to make sure if someone else is not using it properly, that you can call them on it and have them take it down. Right, so, so monitoring is um, a, a, an issue that exists not only with you know, copyright, um, it exists extensively with, with um, trademark law as well, right? And so policing um, can be um, very tedious. And so certainly the, um, the technical restrictions that you, can, that you brought up, Samala, that you can put in place are absolutely um, helpful, right? Particularly if you have a huge volume of work. Um, you can also, for example, um, submit volumes of work for copyright protection, um, not just one off doing a single, um, you know, piece of uh, writing or drawing um, at a time. So there are mechanisms there. Um, but obviously, you know, putting watermarks on, um, restricting the cut and paste. But it can be tedious to police one's IP. Right, so, so the watermarks I find are very effective because when I'm looking for images online um, and I'm always, you know, I, I do try to be very conscientious not to just copy 
anyone's image. I go to specific websites that allow you like Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S, that has copy copyright free images that do allow for people to either give a donation to the creator or give a shout out to them in return for using their, their images. Um, and, um, but if you're a photographer or you have your, your, your content online, do think about potentially using watermarks and, and various techno ways uh, that you can disallow people from copying the information in a format where they can print it, right? Because if you have an image and if, if I can't right click on it and it's this, this small, obviously I'm not going to be able to blow it up into a poster and put it on my wall. It's right, going right. to be super pixelated. So there are ways to uh, figure out that uh, ways to to limit how people can copy your work and use it. Right. And so certainly one of the other issues that comes up to is um, the date of creation, right? And so whether it is an invention um, that is eligible for patent protection, um, right? Folks think in terms of engineering notebooks, um, but it's the same uh, context for copyrights and for trademarks. Um, the creation with well, trademarks, it becomes data use, but the date that you that you create your copyrightable material, um, you should have a record of that um, creation, um, so that um, if you are seeking to enforce someone's um, use of it, um, an unpermitted use of it, that you can look back and be able to say, I created it on such and such a date, and then I did uh, X, Y, and, and Z with it, right? So it's always good to keep great notes um, about your trade secrets and your uh, patentable inventions and your copyrightable material. It looks like, Jen, do you have a question? Yeah, so for example, I wanna offer a free ebook for folks. Um, you know, once they, once they um, book me uh, for a session or at least three package sessions, so it's like a, um, what do they call it? a gift. Um, is that even worth copywriting? So um, one, of the, one of the benefits of copyright in the kind of in the spectrum of, um, uh, of how expensive stuff, stuff is, copy, most um, copyright applications um, mm -hmm. are relatively inexpensive. Um, I believe, um, and I may be incorrect at this because the fees change all the time, but I believe um, the range um, at the Copyright Office is $35 to $110, um, depending on um, which category it falls um, into. So um, it's certainly in, in the context of um, how expensive some things in IP can get. Um, relatively inexpensive to uh, file a copyright application. Yes, yeah, so, and this is with the Library of Congress, you said you had in another yeah. slide. Yeah, and the other thing, Jen, is that uh, I've seen it many times, and I'm sure you have as well, that uh, there's a note from the author that says, uh, copy uh, or reproduction of these materials are prohibited without the author's permission. So if you do happen to find that someone is printing out this ebook and handing it out or selling it to other people, you absolutely have grounds to uh, pursue legal action against them. Right, right. You, you absolutely. You should absolutely be putting the copyright mark on it, um, you know, the C, the year, um, and your name, or if you're in an LLC, you know, the LLC's name, as well as a notice regarding further, further distribution without um, permission. And will, will we get um, that information after the um, webinar, sort of, you know, where to go, what to do kind of thing? Uh, I mean, it's, I, I, so I believe the slides are available. Okay. Yes, we will make the slides available. I'll have you send it to me after the, after the webinar, Sarah, and I can uh, PDF it and um, send it out. And it's copywritten, right. guys. You can't just print it out or give it to everybody. Okay, this right. is for your use. Certainly, I want to share with other people. Yeah, so but, and, uh, and, not and, to mass produce it. <laughs> right, and, and the caveat yeah. is, right, um, and I think I said this at the beginning, but it says it at the end, is that laws change really, really fast. So kind of any fee schedules I, I've talked about, um, those are the fee schedules as today, and they may be wrong because I just may be having a brain moment as I'm 
talking to you and sipping my coffee. Um, so the same thing with any of the legal principles, particularly relating to um, taxes, right? Um, those change with a great degree of, of, of frequency. So it's always really important to um, think, yes, this is the way I want to go, but then get professional advice um, to make sure that it fits for your specific business. Because there's no um, one shoe fits all, just something that works for one business um, may not work for yours because there's always a back story of particular concerns that that business has. All right, trademark, it's branding, right? So it, 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 it is the brand, it is the logo, um, symbol, design, uh, name that customers um, instantly recognize to as being associated with your company. It designates um, a particular quality of product, a particular quality of service that you have established um, for your company and your brands. Um, kind of refer to two types of trademarks, a word mark, a design mark. There is a combined um, word and design mark. It's exactly what it says, right? It's just not the word um, or phrase. It actually has some design element with it. Um, so kind of like um, a copyright, uh, a trademark um, automatically appears um, as soon as you use the mark in in commerce in a very simplistic way. The first to use it in commerce owns it in the uh, territory that they use it in. So the symbols that we see, where are they? Um, which are the T and the R uh, in the circle. Um, those um, designate the levels of protection, right? So I haven't filed, I haven't um, obtained protection from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So I have a TM, which means that I am claiming it as a trademark, um, but I've not, um, it's not, I've not received a certificate of registration from the USPTO. Once I get an R, it means that it's a registered uh, trademark. It means a certificate of registration um, has been issued by the USPTO. Um, lots of things go into choosing a, a trademark. Um, and it goes, um, you, you should kind of thinking about what makes my brand unique, right? Um, and there's, in evaluating a trademark and the ability to one, protect your trademark um, and um, to have it go through the registration process with the United States Patent and Trademark Office with as little um, pushback as possible, um, often depends on whether it's a strong mark or a weak mark, right? So the strongest marks are those that are made up, unique, arbitrary, um, combined uh, two parts of, of different, um, different words, right? A generic mark that won't be approved um, explicitly describes the, the product or um, service um, is merely the place of the name, um, and there's, you know, kind of the other elements that go into it being ordinary, um, it's a personal name, it's a misspelling, alternative spelling, um, it's foreign language, um, you have to actually provide the translation. Um, those elements all go into making a mark weaker as opposed to stronger. Um, I get lots of questions from people who start to do some research on um, trademarks at the USPTO. Um, and they see abandoned marks and they're like, wow, that is really great. That would totally fit my business. And it's listed as, as, as dead. Um, so can I automatically use it? I, I always urge caution when you see a dead or abandoned mark and um, to do further research and find out why um, that mark was abandoned and is no longer be use, being used. Often it's because um, somebody that shows up earlier in the um, hit list at the USPTO has um, successfully um, petitioned the USPTO um, to either cancel the mark or has um, filed an action 
um, saying that they would be harmed by issuance of the mark. Um, and the USPTO has um, said, um, unless you take added steps to prove um, that it's not going to harm this person earlier in, in the chain, um, we're not going to issue it. And that can be costly. Okay. Right. So is your trademark available? Lots of different places to look. Um, Obviously, the best search engine is the, is the USPTO, right? Um, that has the list of uh, current and pending and um, dead marks. Um, so that is kind of where you absolutely have to check. Um, it can be difficult to check that. Um, it does require a skill. Um, other ways um, of looking and checking trademarks, Google search, yellow pages, you know, business trade directories. Um, someone earlier on asked about checking all of the Secretary of State's uh, corporations offices when they wanted to check their business names. That's certain um, the way. There's um, a bunch of trade uh, services out there, you know, to the common ones, kind of like uh, our Trademarkia, Trademark.com. There's a whole bunch of search engines um, and outside search providers. Um, if you are not, if you do a USPTO search and you don't get a hit um, on your um, trademark, um, you should still look at other uses by popping it into a search engine um, and looking at business and trade directories. Um, the other business may not have filed a trademark. It doesn't mean that they don't have a valid um, trademark, however, and you would want to consider somebody else's close um, or possible conflicting use anyway. Right, so when you're picking a trademark, um, your kind of core, in addition to um, the sheer branding and marketing, you know, um, what does this communicate about my company? Um, you want to focus on the substantial likelihood of confusion with somebody else's mark. So if you see a mark that's close, but not quite, quite close, um, you want to say, hmm, if I was the average consumer, would I be confused as to the source of product or the source of, of service, right? Services. Is it the same word? Sounds the same? Certainly you want to stay as far away as possible from famous marks. Um, um, is, the, is the business that's using a similar mark in the same industry, um, same channels of commerce, same customer base? That's kind of the evaluation you want to you wanna go down. So um, uh, I have a favorite movie, it's, uh, Eddie Murphy's Coming to America. Uh, and um, in it, the restaurant that he goes to work at is McDowell's restaurant and it has the golden arcs and um, they serve the Big Mick, and the owner of McDowell's doesn't understand why the representatives of McDonald's keep showing up and complaining about the names, and he's pointing out, well, we're, they're McDonald's, we're McDowell's, they have the Big Mac, we have the Big Mick, right? So this goes down to the dilution and tarnishment of riding off of somebody else's um, trademark, in particular, a famous trademark. So pick something unique um, and really research it. So this is really kind of, so I was trying to come up with um, a, a trademark and um, I, I was listening to some, um, some, some music, you know, and um, one of the who put the bop in the bop, she bop. So I came up with um, Ding Dong and the doggy Ding Dong. Um, it, just off the tip of my um, mind. Um, and um, actually turns out that even though like I thought of, thought I was thinking of something really creative, um, there was already an existing trademark for um, a doggy ding dong, even though I thought my ding dong doggy trademark for um, a door opening system for pets um, was creative. You really have to do research um, into um, your trademarks. Um, this actually shows you what um, a registration looks like. Any questions, by the way, Sam? 
No, but we're reaching um, sort of the time limit of today's webinar. So, um, and did you have another topic to talk about as well? Yeah, so I know there's much more leeway in person, right? I know, I know. But if you guys don't mind, we'll, we're going to be going over time today just a little bit, maybe another, what do you think, like another 10, 15 minutes? Yep. So, so with trademarks, um, it's your brand. It's all about your brand. Um, you have to do a lot of research into it. Um, the, you need to look at the USPTO. You need to look at uh, other search engines and look at all of the uses. Um, and stay away from um, other um, anything that rides off of somebody else's uh, else's um, mark. If someone infringes your trademark, um, you first need to think with your head and not your your heart um, on your strategy. Okay, employer independent contractors. I think in the comments it sounded like a couple people already had businesses up and running that had been in place, right? So um, as your business grows, um, first, if you are hiring employees and or independent contractors, I strongly encourage you to um, form a legal entity and not be a sole proprietor. The um, financial risk in dealing with um, violations for employee law, uh, employment law and miscategorizing um, independent contractors is really significant. Um, and that's one of the kind of big reasons you wanna have a liability shield up. So I encourage everybody to think about that um, if they're hiring independent contractors and employees and they're still sole proprietors. So we have one of the most restrictive tests in the US for who is an employee, who is an independent contractor, it does not follow the Federal Department of Labor, which I believe has a 32 point test uh, we have a three-pronged test. Really, um, a heavy focus is on the middle prong, which is the service has to be performed outside of the employer's usual course of business. Um, so that means if you are a painting company and you're hiring a painter, that person is an employee. It doesn't matter if they work one hour um, every two weeks, they're a short-term temporary employee, right? Or they're a project-specific employee. The duration of, of, of that you hired them for and the number of hours they work is not determinative. What they do for you is determinative. Um, there's a really substantial risk for miscategorizing and not paying the wages correctly between an employee and an independent contractor. The big one is obviously, the AG has a right to investigate and enforce, but there's also a private right of action, which provides for trouble damages and attorney's fees. All right, so second slide, um, which I think will be available. Um, so wrapping up, you guys are all going forth during a really, really unprecedented time, right? It's a great time to start a business, right? Um, but you have to be conscious of the Commonwealth's reopening plan. You have to become really familiar with the Commonwealth's COVID-19 website. So um, go there, I've provided the link. Go to Reopening Massachusetts. Um, there are uh, best practices and protocols for a variety of industries. Um, if you fall in one of them, you need to follow those. There are also mandatory safety standards in place which um, requires having a COVID-19 control plan, having a compliance attestation poster, and providing information and training um, to um, your workers. So I provided the links to um, all of those um, documents and um, to the Commonwealth site. So familiarize yourself with them. And that will wrap it up. There's any last questions? Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. Go back to that last slide with your contact information. Just leave it out there for, for a second or so. We will be sharing these slides with you folks, but just in case, 
um, I, we always hear comments that some people didn't get it later on or what have you. You have Sarah's contact info on the screen. Write it down on a piece of paper in case you need to contact her for any additional questions. Um, and, uh, and just make sure that when you do, um, in the next couple of days, you do check your spam and junk folders because sometimes our emails get stuck in there when we're sending out uh, follow-up information after a webinar. So just make sure you do that. Um, it, and all our emails will come from at umass.edu or at msbdc.umass.edu. So um, thank you, Sarah, for doing today's webinar. We really appreciate it. We're a few minutes over time. Um, so if there's any final questions, this is the time to ask. I know we brief, breezed over the employee versus contractor piece. And... Um, but, and that's very important for people, but many of us startups can't afford to have an employee to begin with anyway. So, uh, but, but when it comes to contractors, if, uh, you know, if you're starting any business whatsoever and you need help with your bookkeeping, well, that's a contractor because as long as you're not in the bookkeeping business. Um, and there's some industries, of course, that kind of get around things by uh, like the, the hair salons, they rent shares. They're not really their employee or their contractor. They're renting the chair. They're renting the right. They're leasing the right for them to come into the this, this salon and use that chair and use the equipment within the salon. That's what they're, they're, they're renting. And, and that could be kind of tricky, right? And then even, um, but so it could be very tricky, um, but it's very sort of well accepted, at least in that industry, Sarah, right? You so have a comment on that. That's, yeah, so there's certainly carve-outs for certain industries, and it's not even for the industry um, entirely. You can have a hair salon that has independent contractors where it has been clearly established that they are renting space and renting a chair. You also have hair salons that have W-2 employees. Um, that's a business decision of what how your business wants to go, um, but it's a matter of, of setting it up and very consciously understanding the elements, right? So if you have an independent, con if you have someone that's uh, renting space, you can't dictate how many clients they have to see in a particular day. You can't dictate their pricing points and you can't control their manner of, of, of um, performing the service right um so it's it's kind of things to think about great thanks and i'm sharing my screen here and contact information for the msbdc which is uh, my employer the massachusetts small business development center here's the contact information for all of the offices throughout the state what i would say um, is that if you are starting a business you might want to consider talking to a, a, an advisor at one of these offices, as well as you already have an existing business and you're considering hiring employees or maybe going from a sole proprietor to an LLC or a corporation. Um, we're not attorneys. We're not going to give you legal advice, but we're business advisors. We can kind of help you um, strategize a bit how to do that, um, especially when it comes to transitioning from being a sole proprietor to then having employees, you do wanna be very conscientious about your financials and the financial impact that that will have in your business. <laughs> and one of the things we do with our clients a lot is look at the budget and do projections uh, to make sure that you're, you're well prepared to take that step um, so you know exactly when to pull the trigger and hire employees. So once again, um, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for going over time just a little bit. And for everyone else, this webinar will be available on our website uh, by the end of this week, hopefully, and the slides will be sent out to everyone who registered. Uh, thank you so much. And Sarah, thank you so much for spending the time today. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Always a pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone.